so before I begin talking about the risks of doing e-commerce in the Philippines, it's very important for me to actually talk about the background or the context, the state of e-commerce in the Philippines. So firstly, um, the state of e-commerce is basically now in the development stage. Compared to Japan, um, the e-commerce in the Philippines is still very young, and but the government actually did research recently and they projected that from the year 2013 to 2018, um, e-commerce, the industry of e-commerce is actually going to grow at a 101.4% growth rate, compounded growth rate from those five years. So because there's a lot of attention now in terms of um, doing online businesses in the Philippines, the government actually created um, long-term goals in order to support this. So it's called the 2016 to 2020 Philippine e-commerce roadmap. So basically what they want to do with this is that at the end of 2020, they want 25% of the GDP of the Philippines. So GDP means the amount of money that you generate throughout the year in terms of business and transactions. 25% of that has to come from online transactions. So because of this huge goal of 25%, what they want to do is to be able to improve the infrastructure, to be able to support um, e-commerce. So by infrastructure, I mean internet connection, we have um, bank systems, online payments, e-payments, and also logistics. So how to get all of the products that are ordered to the customers. So next would be the promising market. Um, right now, the Philippines is experiencing its highest level of consumption and spending in terms of personal consumption. So we've been spending a lot on food, fashion, retail, travel, and also entertainment. It's the highest ever in, in the longest time. So this is the best opportunity for online businesses to start um, getting more customers. But at the same time, if you combine this behavior, of people consuming a lot with the fact that the Philippines is actually one of the highest consumers of internet in the whole world, then you have that middle, that middle ground, which is online shopping. However, right now, it's not yet very developed. So there's a promising market, but the problem is that people are not yet used to doing online transactions. So that brings us to our third point. So right now, businesses who are already doing their businesses online are helping um, the Filipino market, the Filipino customers, to get used to doing their shopping on electronically. So this is by giving them very friendly processes like cash on delivery, free returns and exchanges, to make them feel that, oh, uh, online shopping is actually safe and this is a way of the businesses to train the market into actually learning and actually doing these kinds of transactions. So from here, do you have any questions? No questions. All right. Yes. Okay. So for the, we'll now go to the different kinds of risks that you can actually encounter when you do e-commerce in the Philippines. So it's not just local e-commerce, but also um, cross-border e-commerce. So the first would be strategic risk. So this is senyaku, senyaku, risk. And then operational risk, those that you encounter when you're actually doing the business already. And then next would be legal risk, those that come up when um, you get into a situation related to laws and le legalities. And of course, other risk that is very unique to the uh, very unique to the Philippines. Right. So let's go to strategic risk. So when it comes to tr strategic risk, what you can think, uh, the way you can think of this is whether you are going to do your business or not. This is the environment that you're going to work with. So um, first, we'll go to market challenges. The first most important one is basically the low credit card usage in the Philippines. So the population who owns credit cards is very low. So that basically means that your market is very small. So what 
and in and also in relation to that, those people who have credit cards are scared of giving their information online because internet security is not yet very developed in the country. So when you have low trust in online transactions and also less people who have um, who actually own credit cards, it becomes a challenge for someone who wants to do business in e-commerce. And so the next one would be a risk in terms of competition. So the culture of the Philippines is all about, oh, it's the, there's a new brand that came from Spain or from Europe. I am going to buy from that brand. And then um, we also love going to shopping malls. We like to see the products first, to try them out, to test them and see them first and touch them before we actually give out our money. So this is a big problem. It's a behavior that you have to change when you enter the market. And then next would be local business culture. It's not only foreigners or um, international companies who find it difficult to deal with the business culture in the Philippines. First of all, it's very political. There's a lot of um, bureaucracy and red tape that goes on. There's a lot of approval from different bosses, levels of the organization that you have to get in order to push for your business. And then it's important that you have Connections. Connections is everything in the Philippines. Sometimes it's not what you know or what you can do, but it's who you know that's more important in doing business in our country. And the next, um, relationships with partners can be personal. So in I think in here in Japan, it can be very rigid. It can be very professional. You use Kago all the time. But in the Philippines, you can be friendly. It's a little bit Western. So this could be a little uncomfortable for some people if they're used to the professional setting. And then next would be um, attitude towards time. It's different. So um, in the Philippines, it's very traffic. There's this thing we call Filipino time. Sometimes um, when you say 10 o'clock, it means 10.30 in our country. So this could be an issue for you if, if you're uncomfortable with that. And also, negotiations and business processes take a very long time. Not because we're lazy, but it's because we think as a group. Filipinos think as a group, and we like to consult other people first before we do a business transaction. And sometimes it takes a long time because um, inside the companies, there are people who argue, about whether this is going to be good for us, and it could be politics as well. And then next would be operational risk. So first would be business registrations. Business registration, business ni chakshu. So when you're starting your business, um, thankfully it's faster now. It's faster now, you can already do it online, but your risk would be when you have a similar name with another business. It takes a very long time for you to be able to secure a name if there's like a similar business who already took it. And for foreign companies, unfortunately, it's not allowed. You can't start businesses in the Philippines unless you have $2,500,000 as paid in capital. So it's very, they're trying to protect the local businesses in the Philippines. But if you think about it, maybe if foreign companies come to the Philippines, it would be good for the economy. But as of now, it's not, it's not that way. So um, the next one would be, oh, but for business registration, there is a way around it. If you use the name of a Filipino partner, you can do business as a foreign, foreign company in the Philippines. So you, again, you need connections. So um, next would be taxes and customs. Taxes is zekin, zekin. And then customs would be when you bring in items from a different country and then you have them approved. So tax authorities have become stricter in the last six years during the last president's um, administra administration. But the risk here would be that Reporting is very meticulous, like there's, it's very detailed, and that if you make a small mistake, you're going to have to pay penalties because of many violations if you don't study the tax system of the Philippines. 
And then next would be for the Bureau of Customs. So the Bureau of Customs is actually the most corrupt agency in the Philippines. So, um, Oshoku. So, Ichiban Oshoku. So, that's customs. So, you have, um, when you bring in your products, you have to pay for the management of the entry of your products in the Philippines. But sometimes you have to pay additional to the employees of the government agency to make it faster. So your risk here is that it's illegal. If you get caught, you're going to get into big trouble. And then another one is that you have to pay a lot more. So there are hidden expenses that you have to take care of. They're not in the receipts. It's called under the table transactions. It really happens. So um, this is something that we all have to worry about in terms of doing business, also e-commerce in the Philippines. And the next would be, um, for e-commerce, the, one of the most important things is getting your products delivered, right? But the problem is that um, the traffic in the country is terrible. So um, cars are everywhere. It takes you as much as two hours to get to one place to another. But it's not just the road traffic that's bad. It's also the port traffic, the seaport, where the boats bring in your container your containers for your products. It also gets congested there once in a while. So um, also, if you, if you didn't know, the Philippines is made of thousands of islands. So if you want to bring products to a, a customer in the south of the Philippines, it's going to be more expensive because um, logistics is not yet developed. It's very underdeveloped in the Philippines. So um, unlike here in Japan, you have the Japan Post, uh, the Ubin services. Um, our version of that, it's, it might take you as much as a month before you get your items. <laughs> so your solution here is to go for private logistics companies. So private logistics companies are DHL, FedEx, and all of that. But you can't really rely on the government to do your deliveries for you. All right, so now we look at common business practices in e-commerce in the Philippines, and what are the risks for sellers? So earlier I talked about the context that Filipinos will not buy if it's using your credit card. So you have to find another way to make it easier for them. And the most important for us is to be able to buy using a method called cash and delivery. So when your products, uh, when you order something online, you get to pay it when it's delivered. But the risk here is that customers can reject the delivery. You can say, I don't like this product. So what are the risks for your business? So earlier we talked about supply chain. So imagine if I Iwamoto-san ordered something from me and then I um, everyone already processed the order, you created the product, but then when the product goes back to Iwamoto-san, he says, I don't like it. <laughs> so what happened to all of the effort? Everyone at every point of the value chain, at every point of the supply chain, money had to be spent. So what happens when the product is returned? Then you lose sales, and then it's just terrible, and also in terms of managing your stock and your inventory. So it's not only that, um, costs, but also security risks in terms of people. So for cash and delivery, you have to hire someone to get to deliver and also receive the money from you. There are two risks for this. First of all, what if the person you hired um, is robbed during the delivery. Like someone takes, someone carnaps or someone kidnaps the person because he has lots of money. And then the second risk would be the person you hired pocketing the money. So those are risks that you have to consider as well for cash and delivery. And then next would be returns and exchanges. In some countries, you're not allowed to return a product that you bought online. But in the Philippines, normally, you have at least um, one week, you can return it for free. But then, the free returns and exchanges are 
the costs of this are actually shouldered by the company. So if it's returned in the end, you as a seller have to pay for the transportation again to get the product. So this is, I guess, how the um, customers in the Philippines are so um, spoon-fed in terms of um, e-commerce. We do everything for them so that just so in the long run, they become good customers and they use their credit cards and they buy more online. So next would be a third-party EC site. So sometimes if you can't afford your own domain or you can't afford your own website, what you do is to go to sites like Amazon. You upload your products in their site, but the risk here is that the payment goes to the EC site. So it takes a while before your money returns to you. Like if someone buys, it takes one month or one and a half month before your money is returned to you, like your earnings. And at the same time, you have to follow their policies. If there's something in their rules that is bad for your business, then that's also a risk for you. But in the end, if you don't have a lot of funds for your business, this is still the best way to get your products out. And then next would be, of course, sharing your profit. You're going to have to pay commission to the website, so your earnings are going to be lower. So this is another risk that you have to think about if, say, whether you, you want to decide if you want to sell it yourself or you want another company to do it for you. Next would be legal risks. So are you familiar with Korean makeup? Korean makeup. So um, there's this one brand called Etude House. So there's um, an, a big easy site called Lazada in the Philippines. Um, there was a merchant who uploaded photos of Etude House products, but they were actually fake. And then this company found out about it. So now there's a big legal legal dispute going on between these big companies. So this hap this happens. Um, similar products of lower quality become are sold online or under the same brand name, even if it's not real. So um, why does this happen? Because in the Philippines, you can reproduce products at a lower cost. You it's similar to China, you can copy products. You can copy products at a lower cost and then resell it and make it look like, hey, it's the same brand. So this is very dangerous because, first of all, um, it's intellectual property. It's illegal. And also, um, the image of your brand itself is going to get, get hit if someone says, this is of low quality, and then they associate it to your brand. So it's very dangerous. So it was only recently that product piracy received attention in the Philippines. In 2013, they discovered 5.3 billion pesos worth of fake goods. So that's, if you divide that by two, 5.3 billion pesos, that's in yen. So that's around 2.5 billion yen worth of fake merchandise. So next would be um, business and brand imitations. So this, there are cases of brand elements that are imitated and used by other businesses. So this is actually a burger chain in the United States. So maybe five years ago. And then this is a very, very new one in the Philippines. So I actually go here all the time. I was doing my research for the presentation and I was like, I didn't know that. They ripped off the, the logo of an old business. So this happens. And um, there are laws to protect against this, but it's important that you watch out for these kinds of imitations. And if this happens to you, always consult a lawyer to protect the rights of your um, intellectual property. And this one, it doesn't happen often, fake transactions or fake customers. So this happens when a credit card is stolen and then you use the identity of the person and then buy many products using that credit card. So if you're not able to um, monitor the, this as a business, you could get involved in many criminal, um, criminal acts and then you could also lose the sale because 
it's not actually paid for. It was a fake transaction. So this is very dangerous. So um, how you can mitigate this is basically making sure that there are security features and verification processes for credit card transactions. Next, um, all right, so this is actually the state of laws in Southeast Asia when it comes to e-commerce. So protections for transactions, information privacy, um, cybercrime, protection of personal information, coding Joho, uh, this is uh, personal information, and then content regulation and the website names. There are laws in the Philippines. Everything is enacted. But however, your problem here is that although there are laws, um, monitoring is difficult. So in case that you do business in the Philippines in e-commerce, you have to be active in protecting the rights of your business and also the rights of your customers. So always consult with lawyers, consult with business people who are um, actually good at the business already. You have, it's important. So these are all laws that protect local e-commerce activities. Right now in, um, in the ASEAN region, uh, EQOEC or overseas, overseas e-commerce is not yet protected. So in the future, what the ASEAN region wants to do is to be able to make this better and make transactions easier and safer for the whole region. So for other risks, we have also reputational risks. So I'm sure you see these kinds of um, things online. Products are not of good quality. This is the worst company ever. So what happens to your company if you get into something like this? So in the Philippines, um, it's common for Filipinos to share and talk about their experiences with businesses. And most, most of the time, these posts become viral. Everyone shares the same post, and then your, the reputation of the company is going to be ruined for a long time, if not permanently. So even the most popular EC sites in the Philippines have very hard time in recovering from these kinds of viral reviews and also negative publicity. And so the last risk that is very unique, I guess, in the Philippines is risk from natural disasters. So um, you may have heard in the news a few years ago that um, the Philippines went through really bad natural disasters. So there are lots of typhoons, flooding, no electricity, no communications. So this is a big risk for businesses, also for e-commerce businesses, because deliveries and logistics are going to be affected. So also your, um, the people handling your EC site may not be able to come to work. So this is a big risk for you. So the Philippines has underdeveloped infrastructure to protect against the effects of these natural disasters. And also, um, normally the businesses start to work again after they are able to recover um, from the disaster. So how can you protect against this? First of all, insurance. You need to get insurance. Your warehouses need to have um, ample physical protection. And also, um, when you do your business, it's all, we always have terms and conditions, right? But nobody reads it. But in the terms and conditions, you have to say there that in the event of something like this, um, well, you, the company cannot really do anything about damages because of something like this that you can't can control. So it has to be clearly stated so that your, your customers would know what to expect in terms of what happens in these kinds of situations. All right, so I've been talking a lot about the risks of e-commerce in the Philippines. And right now you might think, ah, Murida, it's impossible for me to do business in the Philippines. But this isn't true because right now, um, it's really one of the main goals in the next four to five years. So the six key areas of the 2016 to 2020 Philippine e-commerce roadmap is actually called the six eyes, the six eyes of e-commerce. 
So improvement of infrastructure, innovation, investment, information flow, intellectual capital, and integration. So for infrastructure, basically the government wants internet connections to be better in the Philippines. They want logistics and deliveries to be faster, payment systems to be safer for customers. So for innovation, lower taxes for those who do their businesses online. So this is a good incentive for those young people who want to sell their products. So they might lower the, the, ta the taxes for these um, kinds of businesses. And important and relevant for um, people who want to do business in the Philippines, they're going to try to fix the law, to, re -amend, to amend the laws in order to be more accommodating and also to invite more foreign people to do businesses online in the Philippines. And also provide more information to them. Because normally, um, foreign investors have to do so much work just in order to understand how to conduct businesses locally in the Philippines. And next would be information flow. This is for data privacy, customer protection, and cybersecurity. Increase the security laws and also um, educate, educate the businesses on how to protect their customers. And then intellectual capital. Um, they're going to include e-commerce as a course or as a major in universities. So more people will be able to it's a very it's going to be a very specialized knowledge it's a very specialized field and then um, which is very interesting because we've been talking about infrastructure the whole time but we've never really talked about people so these people are going to be developed into pe into the people who will lead the country into the e-commerce world and the next finally will be integration so E-commerce will now open the barriers of the Philippines to trade with other different countries. So different countries can now export their goods to the Philippines, and then the Filipinos can also export their goods to other countries when e-commerce is developed in 2020. So that's it for my presentation. Right. Mm -hmm.